Facts and Algebra 2, Lesson 35. Greetings, my students. We're going to have a three-parter in this lesson. The first two are about geometry, and they're pretty straightforward. And then the third one is a little algebra topic. First, we want to talk about angles and polygons. Polygons are straight-sided, closed objects, right? Triangle squares, and on from there. They have interior angles and exterior angles. We're going to talk about the interior angles first, and you're used to this. You know all about this. Triangles are probably the most familiar shape. They have three interior angles, and they always add up to 180 degrees, right? And we're used to seeing rectangles or squares and we know if we draw these right angle thingies in the corner, which they're always there whether we draw them or not, that reminds us that the total of the interior angles of a rectangle is 360 degrees, right? Because 90, 180, 270, 360. That's one way we can figure it out. But another way that's very helpful to imagine the interior angles of a rectangle is to take one corner and go across to the other corner. Now we've created two triangles, haven't we? And we know that the interior angles of a triangle always add up to 180, and so that totals 360, which is the same answer we got using the logic of the right angles in the corners. This this is a fine way to remember, but this gives us a tool that we can use for future, for more complicated shapes. I'm gonna draw, uh, I'm gonna draw a six-sided object as best I can. It's not gonna be perfect, but it doesn't have to be. All right, now I wanna know how many degrees the interior angles of this hexagon will be equal to. It's not gonna be 180, it's not gonna be 360, but what is it gonna be? So what I do is I pick any one of these corners. I will pick this one. Now I'm gonna make sure that I have a line drawn from this point to every other one of the vertices that exist in this shape. From here to here, well, I already have a line there. That one exists. From here to here, from here to here, always drawing from the same beginning point. From here to here, and then here to here, I already have one. So what I see is that I have four triangles that make this up. Whoops, triangles. I was thinking of, because I'm gonna say multiply it by 180 degrees per triangle. And that gives me a total of, let's see, that'll be 720 degrees for this object. And again, we can think of it this way too. Every single one of these triangles is worth that many angles. So it's very easy if we know how many, if we, if we can draw the shape and then divide it up into triangles, then we can multiply each triangle. But what if it's like a 12-sided object? Do we really want to try and draw a 12-sided object? Not really. So what we can do is we can take this little formula and we can turn it into a bit of a rule. We say the number of sides minus two times 180 will give us the sum of interior angles. And we'll check this to make sure this formula actually makes sense. Let's try it on our triangle. The number of sides a triangle has is three. Three minus two is one. One times 180 is 180. All right, that worked. How about a square? The number of sides is four, or a rectangle. 
4 minus 2 is 2. 2 times 180 is 360. Dang, it's working. Okay, let's try it on this one. The number of sides, this was a six-sided object. That's a hexagon. 6 minus 2 is 4. 4 times 180, well, that's exactly what we did right here, and we said it was 720. So this works. This has been a formula to find the sum of the interior angles. Um, you take the number of sides and subtract 2, multiply by 180, all right? This is easier for me to remember as long as the shape isn't too crazy. But if we have a really complicated size shape, that's the way to go. Okay, that's all I have to say about the interior angles of polygons. Now let's talk about exterior angles. Now exterior angles, we've never really talked before, but they exist. Here's our triangle. We know these are the interior angles, but now we wanna talk about the exterior angles, which we can measure in several different ways, but uh, we can do it like this. This is an exterior angle. This is an exterior angle. This is an exterior angle. What's the, how do we figure out the total? Here's the way to think of it. Here we are standing outside of our polygon, right? And we're gonna walk all the way around it. When we get back to the beginning, how far will we have walked? It'll always be 360 degrees. We're just walking in a full circle around it. So we can say I'll write it and then I'll say what it says. Exterior angles of any polygon will always add to 360 degrees. And you can remember it by thinking no matter how many sides this has, once I walk all the way around it, I've gone the full circle. Sometimes it helps to imagine that circle. And that is 360 degrees. So the exterior angles of any polygon will always add up to 360 degrees. All right, here is one problem based on this. And I'm going to show it to you in the book because it's too complicated to try and draw try it to draw well. Here is a polygon. These are all of the exterior angles. Right? We've just extended each line and found a little angle there. And we're given a lot of these in hard numbers, but we have some X's in here. So we have to try to find a way to solve for X and Y. Oh yeah, there's some Y's as well. Okay, so I notice this Y is an interior angle. That's gonna be a little bit trickier, but the X's are all on the outside. So let's start with the X's. What we can do is we can simply add, we know that the exterior angles will add up to 360. So let's just write them all down and see if we can make them add up to 360. So I'm gonna write them in a list this way because it'll be easier to add. We have 65. I'm just going around the circle and I'm writing down all the numbers. 65 plus 50 plus 40 plus 80 plus x plus 55 plus x. Notice the y is an interior angle, so we're not paying any attention to that right now. So I'm gonna add all of this up. These are all the exterior angles. Okay, when I add all this up, I get 
2x plus, now let's see, <clears throat> I have to add all these numbers. Let's see, 55 and 65. I'm going to put those two together because they have the fives. That would be 120, 210, 290 is what I get when I add all of those up. And that has to equal the 360 degrees total when I walk around, okay? I'm just adding these again to make sure I got it right. 115, 155, 235, 290. Okay, I'm gonna copy this to the top of the next page. 2x plus 290 equals 360. Swim the 290. 2x equals, let's see, what will that be? 70. Mm. And then I divide them each by 2. And I get x equals 35. Okay? Remember that this doesn't necessarily have to be a geometric answer. It doesn't have to make sense in terms of the shape but it does have to be algebraically correct, and it is. And we see that it kind of makes sense because this angle here is x degrees, this one is x plus 55. So in this one, it's just an algebraic answer. In this one, it is the actual angle. Okay, now we turn our attention to y. y is a supplementary angle with this x plus 55. I'm gonna draw this little corner on my paper so you can see what we're talking about. There's a straight line like this, and then there's a line like this, and it says y degrees, and it says x plus 55 degrees, like so. All right, and then this goes on and makes part of the shape, and that goes on and makes part of the shape. But we see that these two are supplemental, right? So I know that x plus 55 plus y equals 180, right? Because they make a straight line. I can't solve this, but I can plug this in. These two together add up to make 90. Oh, I forgot the zero. And then I subtract 90 from both sides. And I get y equals 90. And these are the correct answers. Yay! Make sense? Okay, so we can use what we know about exterior angles and interior angles to set up an, uh, cute little algebra problems and then solve from there. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Fancy name, easy idea. Inscribed quadrilaterals. Okay. This, what we're talking about here, is a circle with a four-sided object written inside of it. That's what inscribed means, written within. Notice that this is no perfect rectangle or square. It's just a four-sided object that's written in here. And here's something fancy. I'll tell you what this means. It's just words right now, right? Blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what that means. Okay, let me put letters on this. Uh, 
And please feel free to pause me anytime that you need more time to write. I try to give you a little time, but I know I'm not always the best on that. All right, let's take two pairs of opposite angles. I wanna look at A and C, right? They're opposite angles in a quadrilateral. All right, now let's remember what we know about angles and what we call their intercepted arcs. C intercepts the arc along this green line, right? I think of it as a Pac-Man. This is his mouth. This is how big of a bite he can take out of the circle. Okay, now let's look at the opposite angle. A is another Pac-Man who's taking a bite. His mouth extends from here all the way around to here, right? That's how his mouth opens. Notice that between them, they're biting the whole circle, right? These two guys are, between the two of them, they're biting the whole circle. That's 360 degrees. Remember the relationship between an inscribed angle and the intercepted arc is that the angles are half the size of the arc, or if you put it the other way around, the arc is twice as big as the angle. So if we're biting, if our intercepted arc is 360, then the total of the angles has to be 180 because that's half of 360. So that's my way of saying you can trust me that this is correct because again, in this case, the intercepted arc of these two guys biting is 360, the whole thing. So we know that the sum of the angles must be 180 degrees, all right? That's how we know this is true. But you can just remember, and trust me, I would never lie to you, that opposite angles sum add to 180. Let's do an example, shall we? And there's just one example for this part of the lesson. We have a circle. We have an inscribed quadrilateral. I almost said triangle. That would be wrong. And I would confuse you needlessly. Um, find X, Y, and Z is our instruction. All right, let me just keep drawing. Do draw these out in your homework. This is 80 degrees, 75 degrees, and then we're calling this X, and we're calling this Y. We're told that this is 50 degrees, and it's hard to see that, but it would be from here to here. And then we're told that this is Z degrees, and again, that would be from there to there. Okay, so we have to find X, Y, and Z. Okay, well we know that the sum of any pairs of opposite angles have to equal 180. So to solve for X, we know that X plus his opposite guy have to equal 180, don't they? So that tells us that X equals 100. I can do that in my head. Same thing for Y. Y plus 75 has to equal 180 because they're opposite buddies, right? So that means that Y must equal 105. Trusting my head for that mental math as well. Of course, what I'm doing is I'm swimming the number of fish over. Now, what about Z? Z is from here to here. There's no single angle whose bite covers the exact range of Z, right? because these two points are not anybody's bite. But this whole thing is a bite, right? This angle here bites this part of the circle. All right, this angle bites like so. 
So I know that this is 80, so this must be 160, right? Because it's 2 times 80 has to equal z plus 50. Does that make sense? Because this angle is half the size of that. So in order to make it equal to that, I multiply it by 2. And it's not just the z part, but it's the z plus the 50. Beautiful. So this is 160. So I'm going to subtract 50 from both sides. And I will get, I'll write it over here, z, this side, equals, that cancels, 160 minus 50 is 110. And that's the right answer. All of these are the right answer. Yay! I think these problems are kind of fun. Geometry by itself kind of annoys me, but when we can use geometry to set up algebra, I'm having fun. Okay, part C, we're going to talk a bit more about fractional exponents. I will remind you of what they mean. We remember that when we want to say the square root of two, when we say those words, there are two ways we can write that. One way is to make a pig house, right? There it is, it's the square root of two. We don't need to write a little two up here to say square root because if it's blank, we know it automatically means square root of two. But there's another way we can write it. We can take the base of two and this can also mean square root, okay? How about if we say cube root of 27? We're looking for a number that multiplies three times. We don't need to know the answer for this though. The way we set it up though is we say, okay, the cube root of 27 Right? That's using a pig house, but we can also use a fraction, 27 1 third. Notice that the little number here is what goes into the denominator. This is an invisible 2, but it goes into the denominator. So for both of these fractional exponents, we put the root in the denominator. that, that's the square root, and like that, that's the cube root. Okay, um, I'm a fan of big pig houses, they're cool, but using fractional, fractional exponents is a lot easier to do calculations. So we're going to practice using those so they don't feel uncomfortable to us. Let's try a few more examples. I think there are quite a few of these, but that's okay. They're just pure algebra. We're supposed to simplify four to the minus one half. Oh, now that's scary because we have a minus sign and a fraction. But just like we always have said, negative exponents are trapeze. We flip it down if it's up or we flip it up if it's down. And then we do the rest of it. So this becomes one over four to the one half, right? Don't even let that minus sign freak you out. Just burn it off, do the flip, and then we're okay. All right, now let's try to simplify this. The top is the same. This says take the square root of four. Oh, that's the same thing as saying that. All right, at first you'll probably find yourself reimagining it as in a pig house, but eventually you'll do enough of these where you're like, oh, it's fine, this is just square root of four, that's two, and that's our final answer. All right. This one has two minus signs. Mm, it's got a minus sign out here that's a proper negative. This just means flip it, right? Take the reciprocal of it. 
So let's cover this up and work the problem. We're gonna cover this up till the end and then we'll uncover it. So there it is, it's covered up. Now we'll do, this is like this one, right? Where we just flip it down, one over 27 to the one third. Okay, then we say, okay, well, what is the cube root of 27? Well, that's three. And then we're done. And so we put our minus sign back in. And there's our answer. That's kind of a skimpy little minus sign. There, I'll make it bolder. That's the right answer. Okay, so minus signs out here, we do the very, the minus signs are all behaving the very same way, right? If it's a negative exponent, you flip it. If it's out here, you cover it up. It's the, they behave in the very same way. Even if we're using fractional exponents, uh, we're on 35.5. Did I tell you how many there are? Six. So we have one more after this one. 16 to the three halves. Okay, what the heck? What's with this up here? Huh. All right, well, what I want you to remember is your product rule for exponents. When we're raising a power to another power, we can multiply those together. So what we can do in this case is we can imagine this as three over one times one half. And we can go in the opposite way. There are two different ways we can imagine this. We could say it's 16. Take the square root of 16 and then cube it. Or we can also say, take 16, cube it, and then take the square root of that. Either one of these will work because look, these are the two factors we used. This is like our M and N, right? That we're multiplying together here. And I found this by just saying, let's put the numerator in one fraction and the denominator in the other. So we can imagine these like this. Then we can rewrite this in either order. We can make either one of these the M that goes first and then the other one the N. It doesn't matter, right? We put the one half first and then we put the three on the outside. We put the three on the inside and then the one half. We can do it this way and then we can think which would we rather solve. Would you rather find the square root of 16 and then cube that number or would you rather cube 16, which I don't even know what 16 cubed is, and then calculate the square root of that? I would always rather make my numbers smaller before I make them bigger. I would always rather make it smaller first, which tells me to use the root fraction first. Okay, so that is advice on which order to write these fractions in. You can write it either way, but this way makes more sense. It's easier to do this way. All right, and so the square root of 16, I choose this side. And so this becomes four to the third power, right? Because the square root of 16 is four. And then 4 third is 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 more is 64. And that's the right answer. We could have gotten the right answer by doing this, but no thank you. I don't want to do that much work. All right, and one more. This time we have minus 8 to the minus two thirds. Oh Lord have mercy, again with all the minus signs. All right, we're gonna cover him up and not think about him anymore. This is a trapeze, it flips it down. Okay, see that fraction's too big. 
We can split this though and do it two ways. We can go eight, we'll think of this as two over one times one over three, right? Those are the two pieces. And I like to use the root fraction first. So I would take this and then I would square it rather than squaring it and taking the root. No, this is the way I like it better because it's easier. Okay, and then what is the cube root of eight? Let's see, I'm running out of space. I'm gonna bring this up over here. This would be, and this is over one. Sorry, I didn't write that. Um, oh, that's because I was just splitting the denominator. So it would be one over eight cubed is two, and I still need to square it, right? And then that equals one over four, and then my final step, oh yeah, minus sign. So that is my final answer. I don't bother to keep writing this minus sign and everything because I've got it underneath my finger, safely covered up. I do the whole calculation and then at the very end, I bring it back. Cover up till the end, okay? That's tricky, that's tricky business when we have both numerator and denominator, we've got minus signs flying all around. Um, be patient with yourself, work very carefully, and good luck. Thank you, goodbye.